So we're in Lessons from the Kings, uh, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is uh, lesson number nine in that particular series. Uh, the title of this lesson, Solomon's Strategy for Success. And if you're following along in your Bibles, please open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Chapter 11. So in our series, you know, Wisdom from the Kings, I suppose uh, no series uh, on ancient wisdom, especially wisdom from Jewish kings, would be complete without at least one contribution from the King Solomon, um, son of David. Uh, now the one thing that everybody knows uh, about uh, Solomon is that he was uh, very wise and uh, it's a familiar story. When he was anointed king, he asked God to give him wisdom to govern the people, and God answered his prayer. Uh, in 1 Kings 4.31 it says, he was wiser than all men, wiser than all men. A tremendous gift received from God. And this wisdom, it also explains, the Bible also explained the nature of the wisdom that he had. Uh, this wisdom was exercised in a lot of different ways aside from the wisdom to be a good leader. Solomon uh, studied botany, he uh, built the temple and other great edifices, he wrote poetry, he made a lot of money, uh, wielded power, was active in a, a political uh, arena as well. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 9.22 it says of Solomon, so King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and, and wisdom. So he was a very successful uh, king. Uh, you could say that he, uh, you know, he kind of had the golden touch because his wisdom gave him the ability to succeed in everything that he did. Now as a supremely successful individual, Solomon, therefore, was well placed in giving advice to other people on how to attain and how to maintain success. So you know, in this time that we are living in, economic stress and uncertainty, um, I think we need some uh, positive voices. And one of those voices, of course, I believe is Solomon. So for this reason, I want to in this particular uh, lesson, in our series, uh, Lessons from the King's Ancient Wisdom for Modern Man, I want to review Solomon's strategy for success. Now, the strategy that I'm talking about is found in a book that is much like a personal diary. Uh, in his wisdom, Solomon tried to find out what life was really all about and if it was possible to be truly happy without God. Is it possible to be happy here on earth without reference to God? And so he purposefully experimented with all of life's great attractions. Uh, he um, he uh, experimented with all the sensual and sexual uh, pleasures of life. Uh, he had a thousand wives and concubines. Uh, he experimented with wine or alcohol, strong drink. He experimented with uh, work and career. You know, he had all kinds of projects, building projects, civic projects. He studied a variety of topics. Uh, uh, he was uh, adept in various fields, like I mentioned, botany. Uh, he also exercised power and he played the political game as well, so he, he kind of uh, examined all of these areas of life while maintaining a sober mind and wrote about the results of all of these experiences. So during his experiments with each of these, he would write down his observations concerning what he felt and what he learned from these various experiences of life. Near the end of this book, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a chapter of basic principles of success, how to achieve and keep success throughout your life. And this is the, the section that I'm going to focus in on um, for our lesson this morning. So Solomon's strategy for success. Here we go. Number one, you have got to give in order to get. You got to give in order to get. Ecclesiastes 11 verse one, cast your bread on the surface of the waters for you will find it after many days. Uh, this is a business principle that all successful people learn right away. 
There is no return without investment. There is no reward without risk. This is true if you want to succeed you know, as a student, for example. Uh, you want good grades? You, you want scholarships? You want opportunities? Well, you got to study. You got to invest time. You got to invest effort in your work at school if you want to get a, a return. Without an investment of time and effort in study and in self-discipline, you will not get back you know, good grades, scholarships, and opportunities. Um, it's true in a successful marriage as well. Uh, there's no peace or happiness or growth without an investment of each partner in time, communication, self-denial, giving, listening, so on and so forth. You've got to invest in a marriage in order to have a good marriage. People who fail often have excuses and they blame you know, uh, other people, other things, they're resentful, they're angry. Those who succeed usually do so because they were willing to give some of themselves in order to achieve their goals. As a matter of fact, I go another step further. They're willing to lose part of themselves. They're willing to lose something in order to uh, take that risk, in order to, to gain something else. So the more we give, the more we get. Something that I used to, both Lisa and I used to tell our children all the time, we used to drum that into, into their minds. You, know, you could ask them, they would know, you know. The more you give, the more you get. You know, that's a, a very good life principle from Solomon. Um, Solomon's strategy for success, number two. Diversify, 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 diversify. Ecclesiastes 11.2, he says, divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur on the earth. 2,800 years ago, before business schools and MBA schools, you know, Master in Business Administration, Solomon encouraged people to diversify in order to lessen the damage of adversity. Successful people are not just dreamers who simply make a wild leap of faith or get lucky. You know, we look, I hear people looking at very successful people, oh, he was just lucky. You know, no, 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 no. Successful people understand the reality of the world that sometimes, more often than not, bad stuff happens. You know, bad stuff happens in the world because it's an evil world. Being prepared for that is wise. It's smart to have a backup plan. It's intelligent to have another window of opportunity. Because success doesn't always come with the first, you know, with the first try. It doesn't always come with the second or even the third idea. Sometimes it comes later after lots of tries and in an area we, we never imagined. For example, you know, the IBM company. Right. Originally, back in the 50s, the IBM company believed that their machines, there would only be a market for perhaps four or five of their computers. They were so large, they were so expensive, they thought, well, you know, maybe we'll sell one to the government and then maybe we'll sell one to the, you know, the military. They, they, didn't, they, they thought there was only a small market for the thing that they had produced but they continued producing. They went ahead nevertheless. And so successful people develop as many of their talents. They pursue as many opportunities as time and energy permit them. Diversify. I mean, I don't know a whole lot about the stock market, but one of the things that, you know, that when I read articles about that, they're always telling you, you've got, you don't put all your money, you know, all your eggs in one basket. You diversify, you buy different types of stock. You invest in different types of things. Well, that is true in life. You, know, you pursue all the opportunities that uh, are open to you because not all opportunities will result in success. All right, Solomon's strategy for success number three. Don't worry about the things that you cannot change. Solomon writes, if the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. So Solomon uses examples from nature to demonstrate situations over which we have no control and we cannot change once they take place. That's what he's saying. You know, whether, if a tree falls, it falls either to the north or to the south, but once it falls, it's done. Right? You, you can't change that. That's his point. 
The idea is that we don't always succeed at every step. Things happen that we can't control, and when they do, we have to kind of roll with the punches. I think <laughs> the trip that Ron and Diane and Lise and I have just been on is a perfect example of this. All our itinerary that was meticulously planned and purchased in advance, and we had everything until the Paris attack, and that blew up all of our plans and all of our, you know, our itinerary, so we had to kind of roll with the punches. Well, that's, that's part of life. Life is like that. You know, successful generals, for example, they choose when and where they're going to fight. They rarely go into battle that they don't think that they'll be able to win. At worst, they, um, they uh, recognize when they are losing and they try to cut their losses. Well, life is like that. Sometimes we just have to, you know, cut our losses and uh, live to fight another day. So Solomon is telling us to succeed, we must invest in, 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 um, in our energy, uh, we must invest our energy, in other words, into viable causes, not worrying about the past or mistakes that one has made or the lack of resources or talent one may uh, possess. To succeed, we need to use what we have when it'll do the most good without regard for those things that are impossible for us to control. Because there are always elements that we can't control. If we're waiting to take a step forward in whatever, you know, whatever plan we have in life or work or business or relationship, if we're waiting you know, for all of the variables to kind of settle down before we start, we'll never start. We'll never start. There's always, there's always something. There's always something that's, that's there. So we have to marshal our resources and, and move ahead and, and not worry about the things that we can. Now we can, things we can change, absolutely, go for it. But there's some things in life you just can't change. You have to go for that. Number four, Solomon says, do it now. Do it now. Chapter 11, verse four, he says, he who watches the wind will not sow and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. In other words, there's never a perfect time to begin. Just begin or you'll lose your opportunity. There's always a reason to put off doing something. Always a pretty good excuse for not starting something um, uh, that is challenging or difficult or life-changing. I know that in my own you know, work, you know, I have a to-do list, I'm a to-do list kind of a guy, I want to keep track of all the things that need to be done. Aside from the date, in other words, aside from the things that, you know, there's a time pressure there, uh-oh, this thing I got to get done tomorrow, well then I'll start with this thing because it needs to be in by tomorrow, and the thing that I've got three or four weeks to do will go a little further down the list, but usually when I'm choosing, I'll usually pick the hard thing to do first. I'll pick the hard thing to do first. While I have the energy, while I'm motivated, while I'm, I'm beginning, I'll pick the hard thing. Do the tough thing first. Get the dirty job out of the way. Because you know, near the end of the day or near the end of the week, I've got less energy, I've got less resources, and so on and so forth. So I like to keep the easy stuff for the end, not the beginning. Because there's always an, I, you can always talk yourself out of doing something that needs to, uh, to be done. This is why there are only a few people who make it to the Olympics. And there are only several who have been to the moon. And there's only one Mona Lisa, for example. Successful people act on their dreams and their goals and their vision. They act on it right away. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm always, looking, I'm, you know, I'm always looking for what is the first step that I can take. I don't need to, if there are 10 steps you know, to success or to reach the goal, I don't have to see step three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I have to see step number one or one and two. Just you know, in my prayers, it's always, Lord, show me the first step that I can take. And by faith, I'll continue that you'll reveal the other steps. But I usually want to know what's step one. At a meeting, those of you who have been with me at a meeting, usually the point I'm making is uh, you know, after we've discussed stuff and so on and so forth, I usually say, okay, what's the first thing we need to do if we're going to you know, go down this road? And not you know, allow myself to be talked out of uh, doing something. 
I remember having a dream once and uh, in this dream I had a terrific idea for a lesson and a series of lessons on a particular topic. I don't know if you've ever had the, this experience, but it's like in my dream I just saw everything as it was completed. All you know, the titles and how I was going to approach it. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing. And so half awake, you know, I wake up and I make a prayer. I say, Lord, would you please bring this to my remembrance tomorrow morning so I can get up and, and write this down, this beautiful idea that I had. Well, and I went back to sleep. And then the next morning, the only thing I remembered is that I had a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't for the life of me remember the title, the, all that beautiful outline that was perfectly that I could see in my mind's eye, that was gone. That was gone. And so uh, since that time I have spent many, many, many nights awake at two and three and four in the morning writing down the idea that just popped into my mind you know, and woke me up. No more, Lord, could you give it to me? You know, it's like it's now or never, you know? so you know, I've dragged myself out of bed many times to write a sermon or an outline or whatever, an article. Uh, strike while the iron's hot. So the best time to begin succeeding at your dream or your goal is now. Putting it off until tomorrow, many times, that's the lazy person's way of avoiding the burden of success. Because failure, failure is a burden, but success is also a burden. Because if you succeed, there are demands that success requires from you. And many times lazy people do not want the burden of success. Number five, Solomon says, you never know until you try. Chapter 11, verses five and six, he says, just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed, or whether both of them alike will be good. So some th he says, some things you don't see, the wind, and before there were x-rays, of course, an unborn child, but they're nevertheless very real. Success cannot be obtained or even seen until a person actually tries. Now there are so many people who are blind to the possibility of success because they don't share your vision or they lack confidence in you or they're jealous that your success will reveal their failure in some way or their weaknesses. Solomon tells us to believe the evidence of the unseen. Believe the evidence of God and the power of faith. Trying is just another way of saying, I believe, I see, I know, when others disbelieve or are blind or they refuse to understand. You never know until you try. But if you don't try, you'll never know. You'll never know. Number six, Solomon's strategy for success. Remember God's judgment versus seven to nine. He says, the light is pleasant and it is good for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all and let him remember the days of darkness for they will be many. Everything that is to come will be futility. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes yet know that God will bring you to judgment for all of these things. Success is marvelous as it was meant to be by God. God did not create us to be failures. <laughs> yeah, we fail, you know, usually because of sin. But he didn't create us to be failures or to be unhappy, but rather to be productive and joyful, to enjoy the things that He gives us while we can. You know, so many people feel guilty for no reason. You know, they, they succeed and they feel guilty because of their success. Uh, my mother uh, used to tell me uh, when I was uh, small you know, and someone would you know, give me candy or uh, oh you're a nice boy or I'd play my accordion and they'd say oh that's a wonderful tune you know, and they'd give me a compliment and my mother taught me early on just say thank you. Just say thank you. Don't, don't try to talk them out of the compliment. Just say thank you very much. A gift. 
thank you very much, a compliment, well, I appreciate that, thank you very much. And that's a, Solomon's saying the same thing here, God wants us to be happy, He wants us to be productive. But the pleasure that comes from success is not the, the end of life, it's not the goal of life. In other words, Solomon says that the goal of life is to know and to obey God. That's the goal of life. He says that a little later on in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Success, on the other hand, is a byproduct of the life lived to please God, to know God, to serve God. The danger is making success the goal rather than the spin-off benefit of a good and obedient life before God. What's my goal in life? My goal in life is to know God, to know His will, to do His will. That's my goal. And in pursuing that goal, some of the benefits that come from that is joy, peace, a happy marriage, a good relationship with many, many people, success, to a certain degree, health. But my goal isn't to be healthy, my goal is to please God. Well, in pleasing God, I, I'll try the best I can not to consume things that would harm my, my, my body, you know, whatever, those may, whatever those may be. And so successful people understand that their success is a gift, and they don't become so envious of the success itself that they will do anything in order to get it. I mean, look at the rich and famous and unhappy people we have. Unsatisfied people who sold their bodies and souls to gain success. And many times they'll tell you, I just wasn't, it just wasn't worth it. The, you know what the tip off is when they're talking to rich and famous people? And when those people say, oh, money's not important for me. Well, of course, money's never important for somebody who's got 20 million bucks in the bank. You know, never really important to them. But actually what they're saying, when they're saying money is not important to me, what they're really saying is my money has not given me happiness. That's what they're saying. My money has not given me happiness. And usually when they say money is not important for me, I'd rather, you know, uh, my art is what counts. Well, what they're saying is I'm trying to find happiness in my art or my work or my this or my that. As Christians, if, if we had $20 million in the bank, we might be able to say, um, the money is nice, but this is not what's important to me. What's important to me is to live in such a way that is pleasing to God. That's what's important to me, okay? All right, so uh, number seven, number seven. Solomon's strategy for success. Success is sweet, but short, short-lived. Verse 12, it says, so remove grief and anger from your heart and put away pain from your body because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. You get old before you know it. You get old before you know it. Who won the gold medal for gymnastics eight years ago? Anybody know? Who was the richest man in the world 105 years ago? Anybody know? Someone said, if you want to judge the value of something or how much of yourself to put into this thing, see what meaning it will have a hundred years from today. You know, that thing that's so important to you now, whatever that thing is, how important will that be in a hundred years from now? That really gives you an idea of how important things are. Solomon's advice to the successful is to enjoy your success while you have it because very, very soon it'll be gone. It'll be gone. Good advice for many who uh, work so hard to build families and homes and careers, but they spend so little time enjoying these things and usually end up losing what they had and wondering, you know, why did I work so hard? What's the point of killing yourself at work to have a nice home and to provide for your family and so on and so forth if you never see your family? If you never have the joy of you know, the experience of being with your family? What's the point there? Where's, where's, the, where's the joy in, in that? What good is success? What honor does God receive if we don't take the time to, you know, like the old saying, to smell the roses while we have them? And those of us who are a little bit older, we understand how quickly life goes by, don't we? We understand how quickly life just goes by. One day you're a young man or young woman and you've got everything, you know, you're looking at, at life always 
you know, in the, uh, through the windshield you know, forward, and then you get to a certain age and, you know, and you're, 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 you're saying, wow, uh, my youth is gone. You know? There's more road behind me than there is in front of me. And so Solomon is saying, enjoy it. it it's very short. Learn how to, as a matter of fact, the best gift Solomon says in another passage in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing, there's nothing better, he says, under the sun, meaning here on earth, nothing better under the sun that a man enjoys or rejoices in the work of his hands, meaning the best gift that God gives to a human being while he's on earth, she's on earth, is to enjoy the blessings that he or she has here on this earth, the blessings of a of work and family and eating and food and family, all those things. So many people have a lot of that, they just haven't learned how to appreciate it, how to, how to enjoy it. That's such a sad thing. And yet it's such a wonderful gift when God gives us the ability to enjoy what we have. So um, a very important prayer you know, in your prayer life, a very important prayer to make at any stage of life, young or old, is Lord, please help me to enjoy what you've given me. Whether you're you know, 15 or 80, you know, please help me to enjoy the things that you have given me because those are the best moments that we have here as human beings. I'm not talking about our spiritual life in the Lord. So what, what was interesting about uh, this passage that I've read here, the, you know, the seven steps, is that it's, it has a worldly tone. Solomon writes about the things we need to know and remember and do to succeed in this world. Whether you're a child of God or not, the strategy works. Whether you believe in God or not, this strategy works. Okay? Now one thing not mentioned here, however, is that success in this world does not guarantee success in the world to come. Jesus tells us that there is nothing in this world, no degree of success or wealth, that will guarantee our soul's entry into the heavenly realm. If we study Solomon's life, we find out uh, that despite his great wisdom and incredible success, he failed in this one thing that was needful, and that was obedience to God. That's where he failed. His wealth and his desire for pleasure led him to marry many foreign wives who eventually influenced him to sin. How? By worshiping pagan gods. At first, he built pagan altars and gods you know, so his wives could worship. And then eventually he was drawn into that himself. So there's nothing wrong with pursuing success. Uh, using Solomon's strategy to achieve our goals and our dreams. After all, God's the one who gave him this wisdom to give to us. But in doing this, let's remember that in order to achieve final success, the ultimate goal, which is to live forever with God, we need to follow God's strategy for heavenly success, not earthly success. And that strategy is quite different than Solomon's strategy for earthly success. A couple of things. How do we achieve success in the heavenly realm? Well, first, I think all of us know this, we need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He's the Savior. Secondly, we need to confess our faith in Him. Thirdly, we need to repent of our sins. Fourthly, we need to be immersed or baptized in the water in the name of Jesus. And finally, we must remain faithful to Him by following His commands and leadership in our entire lives. This plan here right, does not negate you know, Solomon's strategy for success on earth. It's not either or. You can be successful on earth following the, you know, Solomon's strategy, and this here, this strategy, this is for heavenly success. How to, how to go from this dimension, the earthly dimension, into the heavenly dimension. So they're not you know, mutually exclusive. It's not either or, it's both and. Success on earth, here success in order to gain uh, the heaven. And so this success here that I've just laid out very briefly, uh, this strategy may not lead to monetary wealth, may not put our names in the history books, but it will put our names into the book of life and it will guarantee our eternal existence with God in heaven. You know, um, 
It's interesting and sad to read about, uh, there's a movie out now about Steve Jobs, the brilliant head of uh, Apple computers. Uh, you know, he makes the, uh, their company makes the iPhone, iPad, you know, all, all the fa fabulous technology uh, that came from this, uh, from this man. We know that he died of cancer at the age of 56, uh, relatively young in this day and age. And don't you know that he had the very best care, the very best doctors, the very best of everything in order to preserve his life? And yet he passed at 56 years of age. I did a little reading on him, found out that he was the 39th out of the 400 most you know, richest people in the world, not just in the US, but in the world, he was the 39th with a net worth, a personal net worth of $8.3 billion. There's some countries that don't have this much money. <laughs> that was his personal worth, $8.3 billion. And during a trip to India, he became a Zen Buddhist and spent time studying that religion. Isn't it amazing that all of his great success here in this world did nothing to prepare him for success in the world to come. So I, I would encourage all of us, if we've been struggling, if we've been discouraged about our work or career, I hope that just a simple lesson on a successful life strategy or a work strategy will help you learn how to better succeed in your family, in your career, business, your character, whatever, whatever it may be. That's what Bible study is supposed to do, right? Help us, equip us for a better life. But I, what I really hope, of course, for all of us, uh, is that we all succeed in going to heaven with Jesus when He comes. Again, not mutually ex exclusive. My hope is that each of us succeed here in this world. But my everlasting hope is that all of us succeed in being together in the world to come, in Jesus Christ. And uh, we cannot repeat often enough the strategy that will lead us to that place. All right, so that's Solomon's strategy for success. We continue with more kings in our series in the weeks to come. Thank you for your attention.